This odd-looking place is where my business, which has mostly to do with television, and your business, which has all to do with energy, first came together. It's Granada's House for the Future, the real star of a long-running series about how we can all save energy in the home. It was 1974 when we first woke up to the fact that there was an oil crisis, and that if we carried on throwing fuel about as if there were no tomorrow, well, there wouldn't be any tomorrow. So, a group of us at Granada Television persuaded the company to invest in and film the creation of an energy-saving home for a real-life, comfort-loving family. We got together with a first-class architect, bought a dilapidated coach house, it's still under there somewhere, and then we found the Grants, a family of four, Jeff, Lynn, and their little daughters Helen and Caroline. But we also needed specialist help, people who were among the front runners in the energy field. And we found them at the Electricity Council Research Centre at Capenhurst. After the best part of two years hard thinking and harder labour, this is how the home turned out. But has it worked? Have you found that from the point of view of uh, a reasonably normal, comfort-loving family that the house has worked for you? Yes, it's worked very well. In fact, we've been quite impressed. Of course, this house, Lynn, has a whole lot of special characteristics. What do you think's been the key factor? Oh, the insulation, by a long way. And so what do you reckon is the cost of heating this house over the year? The best example we can give is, for instance, the bad winter of 78, 79, when we had snow which lasted until, I think, May. Our actual heating, all our heating costs for the whole of that winter were about 80 pounds. Well, nice work if you can get it, but of course, that's the question. Can we get it? Most of us live in ordinary houses and we pay ordinary fuel bills. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's just consider what it is we've always regarded as normal. I guess most of us live in or have lived in or would like to live in a place like this, a typical suburban semi, and we've always regarded them as nice, simple, convenient boxes. But now we're beginning to realize that they're very far from simple and they're not even all that convenient, at least not in energy terms. Now, no two apparently identical houses ever behave in quite the same way. But an awful lot of things are done by and happen to the energy that we put into them in the way of lighting and cooking and heating. To begin with, all that energy leaks out again. Well, let's suppose that you spend £10 on getting the Department of the Environment's average British house nice and warm. Here's where that 10 quid's worth of heat goes to. 25% finds its way out through the roof. 35% is transmitted through the walls and into the garden. 10% goes through the glass of the windows. 15% goes through the floor. And the last 15% seeps through unnoticed spaces around doors and windows. Of course, the houses never really get as cold as the great big world outside because normally you pump more heat in to replace any that escapes. It's all very well to say that the houses leak heat, but you don't realise it, well, not until the fuel bill comes along at the end of the quarter, because you can't actually see it happening, or couldn't, until this sort of thing came along. This is an infrared camera, and whereas this kind of camera sees light, the Arga Thermovision, among others, sees heat and it interprets different surface temperatures as different colours. So hot shows up as red, warm as either green or purple and cold is in the blue range. Now the picture you're seeing of me now is a light picture but here's a heat picture. Now this is the hand that I've been waving about so it's comparatively cool. But the other one I've had in my pocket so it's nice and warm and it shows up red. But there are even better things for this camera to look at than me. This, for instance, is a pair of test houses at the Electricity Council Research Centre at Capenhurst near Chester. And I said earlier that the folk here had been helping us with the design of the house for the future. They've been looking at domestic energy usage for about eight years now. Anyway, these houses are exactly the same inside and they're pretty much the same outside, except for a few surface differences. But in fact, they're far from being the same. That one is built to normal building regulation standards. It's got an 11-inch cavity wall and two inches of fibreglass in the roof. But this one has got very much higher standard draft proofing. The window area has been reduced and it's insulated to the equivalent of four inches of fibreglass all the way around, roof, walls and floor. 
The houses are identical in one respect, though. The temperature inside is 18 degrees centigrade higher than it is out here. Mind you, if you look at them with the naked eye or the film camera, you can't see whether one house is losing heat faster than the other. But the infrared camera tells a very different story. You can see that the house on the left, the one insulated to the higher standard, has a green front wall, which means that it's colder than the purple front wall of the one on the right, with some blue areas that are colder still because of locally thicker insulation. And cold outside walls mean that the heat is staying inside. Inevitably, in both houses, the windows show up as warm or even hot, but the house on the left has smaller windows, so they're losing less heat anyway. Very clever, very pretty, but so what? Especially as if we turn the heat off now, both houses will be as cold or very nearly as cold as the surrounding air within a few days. Well, the point is that this house will lose its heat more slowly. The insulation won't stop the heat going out altogether, but it will slow it down. A pot of tea with a cosy over it stays drinkable far longer than one without. And this house will cost less to keep comfortable. Less heat is going out, so you have to put less heat in. And just how much heating can insulation save? Well, sometimes quite fantastic amounts. But that's the main reason for Mr and Mrs Grant's £1.65 pence a week heating bill for house, home and hot water. So although their insulation, and uh, there's a lot of it about, costs them £1,200, it saves them at least £125 a year, so that they get their money back in just over nine years, or sooner, if the price of fuel increases. And after that, they can put their 125 quid into the bank. All the same, they don't live in a normal house. So can those of us who do expect to save enough fuel to save us a reasonable amount of money? Well, Dr Jack Sivier worked with us on the design of the house and on the results we got from it. Jack, does the fact that the Grant's house is abnormal make insulation irrelevant for the rest of us? Oh no, insulation is very important for all houses. Loft, walls, draft stripping, and a bit of do-it-yourself double glazing are all worthwhile. And what sort of thing are we talking about? I mean, four inches all around the house or something simpler? If you have a cavity wall, that can be filled. With a loft, you can normally get in there and put in, well, I'd recommend at least 150 millimetres. And even simpler? You can manage your house, draw your curtains when it's dark, um, draft strip, like I said, keep your windows closed to prevent uh, drafts. Um, they, they're the simple sorts of things which people can do now without, doing any, without costing any money at all. I think most people now expect fuel prices to go on rising. How does that affect the argument? Well, it reinforces it. If the fuel prices are going to go up faster than inflation, or faster than the cost of living, then uh, you want to insulate now and get the benefit this year and for, uh, onwards as the fuel prices increase. And how does the individual's choice of fuel affect the individual's decisions? Well, the, the more expensive you fuel, the more important it is to insulate. Because you're saving energy, which is costing a lot. So you can see that with good insulation, your running costs are going to get lower and lower. But as they fall, the capital costs get more and more important. By that I mean what you pay for the heating equipment. It's rather like deciding what to do with the car as the cost of fuel goes up and up. I mean, this one only does about 20 to the gallon. But there's not a great deal of point in spending a lot of money on one that does 45 miles to the gallon if you only drive, say, 50 miles a week. You might just as well stick with this one. But the bloke who does 500 miles a week is in a very different situation. He'll probably plump for something more economical. Well, it's the same with heating houses. As the consumption drops, that's the equivalent of doing a low mileage in a car, the difference between the annual costs of using one kind of fuel and another becomes less, and much less important. What matters then is the installation cost, the cost of the gas or oil boiler or electrical heating system or solar roof, whatever you decide on. And, of course, if it's very cheap to install, you could say you get your insulation for nothing. Well, let's see how that works out in practice. Let's take, for instance, that highly desirable mod semi-debt with three-bird Goodgudge Neskitten owned by Mr Eric Groin. Hello. Uh, not yet. I'll let you know where to speak. He decides that he's going to put in central heating. But... Not oil, he says. Not likely. But what, then? Gas or electricity? 
Well, since our Eric here has got an O level in maths, he's able to work out that the gas system, that's the boiler, the hot water side, and seven radiators, drawing room, sitting room, hall, three bedrooms, and the bathroom, will cost about £950. He also reckons, quite rightly, that with the 1979 increase in the price of gas, it'll cost about £150 a year to run. The same house with, say, storage heaters will cost more like £210 a year to keep warm. So, says our Eric, it's thumbs down to electricity. Thumbs down to elect... <laughs> Wait a minute, says I, and you. The storage heater system only costs £550 to install. That's £400 cheaper. So, he says, so, since the gas is only saving you £60 a year, it'll be the best part of seven years before the electricity's eaten up the 400 quid that you had left over from the installation. Oh, yeah, he says thoughtfully. Suppose that our Mr. Groin spends some of it on extra insulation. He puts an extra 50 millimetres, two inches of insulation in the roof, and he has his walls cavity filled. That costs another £200, so that the storage heater system with the insulation has now cost £750. He's still got £200 in the bank, but his running costs, because the house loses less heat and needs less to replace it, are now much lower. Instead of costing £210 a year for electricity, it now only costs £160. And what was the cost for gas again, Eric? £150. Yeah, that's only ten pounds difference. Four thumbs up to electric eating. Here, uh, go on a minute. If I had gas to cheek a fuel at the moment, eh? At the moment. Oh well, all right then. At the moment, if I had the cheaper fuel and the insulation, it'd be even cheaper than electricity. Yeah. Only you wouldn't have the money for the extra insulation, would you? Because you'd have spent it all on the boiler and the radiators and the piping that... Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Stupid. All this adds up to a set of logical reasons why normal people with a normal liking for comfort and for living in normal houses are finding that electric heating is working very well for them. These are the homes of normal people and they look normal enough themselves. In fact, this, a small medallion, is the only giveaway. It means that these houses have been built to a higher insulating standard than the 1976 building regulations laid down, and that there's careful attention to draft proofing. And of course, it was the Electricity Council who devised these medallion homes. All these houses are heated electrically, using a system that takes advantage of the economy seven rates. Well, there's no one on this estate called Eric Groin, I hope. But since the people here are living in the same sort of situation he will be, let's see how things worked out for them. The all electricity, we had our doubts because of what people had told us beforehand. But we've found since that that was quite unfounded. I think the hot water, which is most important to me, washing nappies, and we never run out of hot water. Uh, we thought to ourselves, well, all electricity, and it's amazing the number of stories that circulate about the cost. It really f frightens you a bit. Anyway, we decided that we'd have a go. I like it because it's so much cleaner than the old house. With using solid fuel, everything wanted cleaning and dusting every day. Besides from pulling everything up from the cellar to the upstairs, it's quite a big house with attic and cellar, and there's quite a lot of stairs to go up and down. So I find it very much easier. Mm. Well, we're very happy with the home and the heating and everything keeps nice and warm in the winter and it's, everything's very clean. We've been in there a year now and I think it's, it's very economical. It's good heating and this house, I mean, it's, it's got a gold medallion award and it's, it's just really super insulated. But the beauty being that once you've got that, once you've paid for the heat, you've heated the house, you know, it does tend to, to keep warm. I'm not talking about just through the week, you know, right through the winter. Well, it's easy to see why they're happy, but there's one bonus from insulation to the sort of levels that the electrical industry is recommending that we haven't mentioned. And it's a key one for us, the people who use electricity, and you, the people who make it and sell it. 
Houses that are well wrapped up don't get cold quickly, we've seen that, but uh, they don't get hot quickly either. What will keep heat in will keep heat out, and that means that they don't become unbearably hot on a sudden, uh, unexpected, sunny day. And that means that storage heaters using off-peak fuel make more sense than ever. They warm up slowly, while the well-wrapped house is slowly cooling down. And they cool down slowly, which is an ideal match for a house that heats up slowly. And what's more, they're one of the cheapest systems to install, leaving even more for insulation and draft proofing. What their use means is that there's a bigger market for off-peak electricity, so that the bigger and more efficient power stations come into their own. Because they're more efficient, they can make cheaper electricity. They can't, of course, be turned off and on at the flick of a switch, but if the demand for off-peak is high, on the other hand, they won't need to be switched off, and we'll all benefit. So, more insulation, more storage heaters. More storage heaters, more off-peak demand. More off-peak demand, more efficient power stations, more cheap electricity, more customers, more jobs, more serendipity. And all because of something as simple and as straightforward as a tea cosy. So, think insulation, think electric. <coughs>